أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون والذين هم عن اللغو معرضون والذين هم للزكاة فاعلون والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإنهم غير ملومين فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلواتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يرثون الفردوس الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ثم أما بعد We were up to the ayat about guarding one's privates والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون And we made the intention إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإنهم غير ملومين That we're going to discuss some of the lessons in this ayah بإذن الله today And specifically in regards to married couples and the issues they're in that are big problems in the Muslim community nowadays. And simply because the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jal is being ignored in these matters in the home. I mentioned this at another dars, but I want to reiterate it. A lot of times what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals as universal guidance, when you share it with somebody that has a specific situation, the first thing that comes to their mind is, I know the ayah is there but it doesn't apply to my situation. I have a special circumstance, right? The ayah is great, it's beautiful. But it's, you know, I understand that that's there, but you need to understand my specific situation. And this is the attitude that the, the prescription and the guidance and the solutions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided, they are theoretical and maybe they apply for everybody else. But for me, you have to give me something different, you know? And so this attitude, we have to shave off this attitude. And we have to develop the attitude that Allah's solution subhanahu wa ta'ala is the solution. What He subhanahu wa ta'ala offers is brief, is concise. It's sometimes it seems like that solution is too easy to be right. It's too simple to work. But subhanAllah, that's the beauty of this deen. Simple solutions that help the most complicated problems and, and solve them and, and take care of them. So the thing that we wanted to share today inshaAllah ta'ala are the words إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ These are the people who are in regards to their privates, they guard them, especially in regards to their privates, except where they are rightfully allowed to have pleasure with, you know, have intimate relationship with who? With their spouses or what their right hands possess. And I'm going to leave the right hands possess part for the end, inshallah. Because that's an academic discussion, we really shouldn't be bothered with it too much nowadays. Because it's, I don't, I'm not sure if anybody here has anybody that their right hand possesses. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, let's, let's talk about what is most relevant within our context and then discuss that. Usually, most of the time when Muslims ask about the possession of the right hand, it is, how come Allah said that? How do we tell the non-Muslims about this? Right? That's basically what it comes down to. First of all, even that attitude in and of itself is incorrect. We're not here to explain or, you know, do away with the flaws in the Qur'an ma'adullah. The Qur'an is flawless and the deen is flawless. Right? So the urge shouldn't be to, you know, let me tell you, it's not so bad. Let me reconcile it for you so you don't feel so bad about it anymore. Because that's, not, that's really not the issue. You know, the people who raise criticism against our deen, they will come up with things like polygamy and, you know, uh, the, the concubines and the women in paradise, the hur and in paradise, right? And they'll come up with violence in the Qur'an and etc., etc. It just the list just goes on and on. The male versus female witnesses, most of them having to do with the feminist movement, if you, if you think about it, right? But when you respond to one criticism properly, guess what? They'll say, oh yeah, let me come up with another one. 
And then you go and respond to that one, and then they'll come up with another one. And then you respond to that one, and they'll come up with another one. So you have to understand to play the game a little bit. And the way we understand to play this game is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He responded and rebuttaled Bani Israel, who were very good at asking questions. And Allah quotes a lot of their questions in Qur'an. They ask this, the Messenger answers. They ask that, the Messenger answers. Until it reaches the saturation point, and they ask after that, and the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is told to give them the most stern of the answers. Right? They ask about Dhul Qarnayn, find the answers been given. They ask about Taruh, find the answers been given. They, they, you know, they ask about the people of the cave, the answer has been given. They ask who gives you revelation, the answer has been given. They keep, how do you have a boy sometimes, how is there a girl born sometimes? Go ask your Lord this, the answer has been given. And then eventually they ask again, أَيْذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا وَرُفَاتًا أَيْنَّا لَمَبْعُوثُنَا خَلْقًا جَدِيدًا This is even asked by the, some of the Bani Israel. Are we going to be raised again even though it's in their revelation? This is in Surah Al-Isra. And Allah this time, you know what? That's enough. قُلْ كُونُوا حِجَارَةً أَوْ حَدِيدًا Tell them even if you turn into rocks or iron, you're going to be returned again. So it's, a, you know what the response is? You know what? Enough with your questions. Because the intent of the questions are tangents. Because you know the, if you, if you watch media, which I don't recommend, but if you watch media, what happens is the interviewer is in charge of the discussion. Why? Because he's the one asking the questions. The one who's answering the questions is in a defensive position, and the one who's asking the questions is in an offensive position. And obviously the one in the offense is winning, right? So you will find, even if the interviewee, the one being interviewed, has the best answers, as soon as he gets a good answer, the interviewer can change the subject and ask another tough question, or go to another controversy to make him feel like he lost, right? He has the last laugh. Now look at the dialogue in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly, constantly, He poses questions to the people. مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ أَمْ لَكُمْ كِتَابْ فِيهِ تَدْرُسُونَ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Questions, questions, questions. He's changing the direction of the conversation, so the dialogue is in control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Nowadays, if you compare that to our times, what's happening? Who are, where are the questions coming from? The Muslims or the non-Muslims? The questions are coming from the non-Muslims, and we feel all the time that we're in a position to give the answer, and give the answer, and give the answer. So by definition, we've already lost this dialogue. You follow? The Muslim is in a winning position when he learns and she learns to ask the questions. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us much more burning questions than anything that can be asked of the Muslims. We respond to them with dignity, that's fine. But as a dialogue, we're supposed to be the ones in a position of asking questions. After all, we're not the criminals. The people who defy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are engaged in a crime. The people who commit shirk are engaged in a crime. The people who commit zina are engaged in a crime. The people who are killing unjustly are engaged in a crime. So the Muslim is being made to look like the criminal. And so he feels like maybe I should respond because I need to prove that I'm innocent. You already know you're innocent, you're Muslim. <laughs> you know, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you believe in the Qur'an and the sunnah. You know, it's, it's what teaches you what innocence is. And as opposed to what everything else is. So it's a, it's a shift of mentality. So I'm going to address that malakat aymanukum issue at the end, bi'idhillah. So now we turn to this idea of, you know, uh, guarding one's privates within marriage. Before a young man gets married in our times nowadays, you know, they've watched a few movies here and there before they made tawbah and they became religious. And they have this idea of what love is and what marriage is. And, you know, brothers come up to me all the time, brother man, I, I gotta get married, man. You know, as though like in their head, once they get married, all their temptations are just gonna poof, disappear, and life is gonna be bliss, and we're gonna read Qur'an together, you know. And, <laughs> you know, it's gonna be just this spiritual experience, right? And there's this, this fantastic view of what marriage really is. Those of you that are married are probably not even laughing right now, because they're like, what? <laughs> because, what is he talking about? <laughs> Because you don't even remember feeling that way, right? So, yeah, it, you know, it's many a times you do run into a brick wall because what is, what is shown to us about marriage, our idea of marriage, especially the modern mind, whether Muslim or otherwise, the modern idea of love and companionship and a man and a woman together, the idea of it is basically the same as dating. Okay? And dating means you have all the fun and when things get difficult, you walk away. That's what dating is, right? So what we actually, when we think of marriage, men, brothers and sisters even, when they think of marriage, they're thinking of the aspects of marriage that are like dating. But you know, there's a lot more to marriage than dating, right? There's the bills, and there's the chores, and then there's, you, have to, you have to learn to live with another person, which is very difficult. You do things your way, she does things her way. 
and now there's a towel hanging the wrong way or the toothbrush is in a different place or you know something had there's a little, little too little sugar in your coffee or something or little things start adding up and start in the beginning I love her too much I'm not going to say anything I can handle this but a couple of years later it starts piling up and you're like again with the sugar you know and it starts adding up now this doesn't happen in dating because you're tired of this girl go on to the next one or she's tired of you I, I think you know I uh, I don't want to deal with your smell anymore I'm out you know it's just walk away from it but marriage is a serious commitment and you know the terminology used in Quran is very strong Al-Muhsanat, Al-Muhsinin. You know, Muhsin, you know the, the, the Ihsan, in Arabic, it's the, the word used for putting someone inside a fort, like a military camp. The idea of that is there are enemies outside, once you're inside this military facility, you're safe, right? So women are told, are described as women, are, are females that have been put inside the camp, a protection. And who's protecting them? The husband is. From everything, from sadness, from difficulty, from shamelessness, in terms of ignorance, he's protecting them, he's giving them an education, he's protecting them in every single way. And the, the one who wants to get married, Allah describes him, Muhsinin غَيْرَ musafihin. They are people who, they are, they are men who have the intention of bringing women into this fort, into their protection, to start families, not just to get their desires out. غَيْرَ musafihin. Musafih is someone who has hormones overtaking him, he just wants to get his, you know, his lusts out of his system, that's why he wants to get married, that's it. Right? So Allah changes our mindset about marriage. But if you marry for the right reasons, then you will have a healthy relationship with your wife. If you marry for the wrong reasons, and the wrong reasons are, I just, you know, I have hormonal problems, that's why I want to get married. And that's it. You know what, you're gonna have a miserable marriage and you'll never be satisfied. And you probably, many of you learned this the hard way already. Because the intention was all messed up. The intention has to be to start a family, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to do, to increase the good in society. And then the other principle we have to remember, you know, and if we don't remember it, a lot of times husbands and wives are very dissatisfied and they're more prone to the fitna of fahsha. There are new statistics out there, very disturbing. They were released last year. Some sociologists did statistics on, you know, sites, you know, um, you, know you, can, you can do uh, IP address uh, search on where the hits are coming from on various websites. And they did statistics globally on pornography. And the majority comes from Muslim countries. And, the, you know, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Because there's a serious problem in the Muslim countries. It's a, it's a horrible thing. It's unthinkable. But we're on top of this statistic. Why? Because there's a serious problem inside the home. And it's not just young people, it's married people too. You know, we have to change the way we, we take care of our families so we can address these problems. And if we don't address them, then we, we're not able to guard our privates. Not our eyes, not our hands, and then things get worse beyond that. Right? So now, the principle, the underlying principle in marriage, as it is in everything else in this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you worry about your obligations, and you forget about your rights. I know that sounds very harsh. But if you can do that, I mean experiment it for six months. For, forget about your rights, worry about your obligations. What can I do for my wife? What more can I do for her? Can I buy her a gift? I haven't given, given her anything for a long time. You know, if she makes a mistake, pretend like you didn't even, she didn't even make it, right? وَإِن تَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا تَصْفَحُوا means cover the page. When you cover a page, you can't see the previous page, right? So if your wife makes a mistake, you pretend like you don't even see it. Right? Instead of bringing it up and again with this, you know. So you cover her mistakes. And you go out of your way to fulfill your side of the obligations. You go out of your way to show sabr and compassion and overlooking. And even the hurtful comments, you don't respond to them except with a smile, etc. etc. You go out of your way to do your part. Because you know, when you start expecting... You expect certain things from your wife. She should take care of me. I have physical needs. I have needs. I have psychological needs. She should give me company. She should be nicer to me. She should smile when I come home from work instead of frowning at me all the time and reminding me what groceries I didn't do or what laundry I forgot to finish, right? She should be nicer to me. There's always these expectations in your head. And you know the believer, who does he expect from? The believer expects from his Lord, right? Because everyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will disappoint your expectations. Da'uf al-talib wal matloob is a universal principle Allah azza wa jal revealed. The one who seeks, the one who demands is weak, has been weakened. And whatever he seeks has also been weakened, inherently weak. So, what, so long as you place any hopes in creation, 
you are necessarily going to be disappointed. You put hopes in your boss, he's going to give you a promotion, it's not going to happen. You know? You put hopes in a friend, he's going to come through, he gave you an appointment time, he's going to pick you up, he's going to be late. He's not going to be able to make it. You, you put hopes in creation, you put hopes in things, they will disappoint you. Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to learn to place hopes only in Him. And then when this attitude is developed, then what happens is, if your wife gives you a little, you're very grateful because you weren't expecting anything. What, a lot of times what happens is, we read a couple of Islamic books, maybe a couple of a hadith about the rights of a husband and the rights of a wife, and what, the crazy thing that happens is, husbands are reading about what husbands deserve, and wives are reading about what wives deserve. As opposed to the opposite. Husbands are supposed to be reading about what? What the wives deserve. But everybody's obsessed with themselves. They're selfish. Even when they come to Islam, they learn and they study that which serves them. So for example, parents, they may not know any Qur'an, but they know, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ يَحْسَانَ They know that one. They don't even know where it is in the Qur'an, but they know this by heart. Right? Why do they know this by heart? Because it serves them. Right? The men, they may not know much about Qur'an, but as soon as the wife says a word, الرِّجَالْ قَوَمُونَ عَلَى nisa. You know, the men are قَوَمُ Because it's self-serving. Now you're not a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're using Allah's deen to serve yourself, right? So one has to understand, our deen first and foremost is a responsibility to fulfill our obligations. So we study and we learn, what, how do we excel with our wives? How does the wife excel with the husband? You know, I gave a khutbah some time ago about the rights of the wife and the husband. And you know, I made two handouts. One was advice for wives, one was advice for husbands. And I said it over and over in the khutbah. Don't read the rights of the husband. Please, husbands, don't read those, just read the rights of the wife. I made a handout for you, don't read the wife's handout, read your handout. Twenty brothers come up to me after the khutbah. Brother, that handout for the wives, can you give me a copy? It's like, no, I can't give you a copy. <laughs> because you're gonna go home and say, see this, point number four right here? You've been missing out on this for six months, you know? This, and these are real problems in marriage. This can lead to a really serious turmoil in marriage. So you want to have a healthy relationship in marriage, you have to take care of your obligations. And you, subhanAllah, Allah will put sakina in your marriage. And Allah Azza wa says about marriage, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً It's beautiful words of Qur'an. You will find these words applicable in all of your married lives, those of you that are married. Allah says, He put between you, between the husband and wife, love, mawadda, and it's passionate love. Allah says, mawadda, وَرَحْمَةً and mercy. Because in the beginning of marriage, is very passionate. You're obsessed with your wife. You can't think about anything else. Your friends call you, they go straight to voicemail. Right? Because you just got married. For, you know, for six months you're out of, you know, out of sight, nobody sees you. But then as marriage goes further, what keeps marriage alive? Isn't that anymore? Because other obligations come in. There's kids, there's work, there's not, you're not, you're not on the honeymoon anymore. How do you keep the marriage sustained? Rahma, mercy towards your wife. Mercy towards the husband. Courtesy between you. You know, this man comes to Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, I want to divorce my wife. And he says, why do you want to divorce your wife? He says, I don't love her anymore. I don't find her attractive anymore. And so Umar radiallahu anhu asked him, فَأَيْنَ riaya? What about courtesy? What about the courtesy you owe your wife? She doesn't take care of your kids? She hasn't put up with you all this time? You know? And you know, we have, we're difficult creatures to put up with men. Right? We're, we're very difficult creatures to put up with. And our wives put up with us. Even if they share, you know, say a couple of words here and there, in the end they still put up with us, right? So they do quite a bit for us. So we can't just say, oh, well, she doesn't look like what I was imagining the, you know, back in the day when I didn't used to lower my gaze, I saw some things on TV, and I was expecting that. You know, this is, you know, really, it's, it's not the healthy attitude. You have to, if the believer w watches their gaze, and they control their temptations, and then they do the best with their wives, they will be the most satisfied, and they won't have any temptations outside. But at the same time, and I'm ranting on the brothers, but at the same time, the sisters have to understand this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created men and women very differently. Men, their biggest weakness is women. They could be richer, they could be poor, they could be, you know, healthy and not very healthy, you know, skinny and fat or tall, doesn't matter what culture, what language, all of them have the same weakness, women. And women, Allah azza wa jal, many, in majority cases, He made them oblivious to this weakness of men. They don't realize how bad it is. So when the ayah comes and a woman reads it, lower their gaze, oh yeah, I could do that. And they're like, what's the big deal? Why can't men just lower their gaze? And then you tell them, you don't understand. What don't I understand? You have eyes, I have eyes, they have retina. You know, it processes the same information. So what's the problem? 
You see, they're not, they don't understand the power of this desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put inside of us and mentioned as number one, shahawat min nisa Number one of the desires that were beautified for men were desires for women. Right? The number one fitna, the Prophet ﷺ fears for the men of this ummah is what? Women. Because it's a serious problem. So the, if the wives understand that, then instead of condemning their husband, why are you so weak? How come you can't control your eyes? Instead of knowing that, they would accept this is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to, uh, you, the wife has a role of supporting her husband and becoming strong. And she can do that by warding temptations off from him, not by lecturing him. You know, and, and this is the other thing that's very important for wives to understand. The husband, he goes to the office, or he goes to the train, and there are women horribly dressed. They're sitting there smiling at everybody, trying to, you know, basically this is all these women have in terms of their dignity. They're not respected for their intellect, they're not respected for their opinions. So all they think is, we're going to be respected if men see more of our, you know, our shame. So they, they dress it in decent fashion because when men look at them, they feel kind of, you know, self-respect. Like, I'm worth something, people are looking at me. That's basically what it is. It's really horrible, it's sad. But then they go to the office and the secretary is smiling at you, saying, how are you, how was your day? You know, what are you getting for lunch? Oh, you're fasting, oh, that's nice. You know, and they're, they're smiling at you. And then you go, you know, on every ad, women are smiling at you, and then you get home. And you open the door, and the wife says, where were you? Oh, the, 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 tra <laughs> the train was late. Oh, every day the train is late. Oh, I understand. You know? And there's a frown every day. And the first day it's okay, the second day it's okay. Ten years of this, twelve years of this, what's gonna happen? The husband has resentment towards the wife, even if he doesn't say anything. He's building resentment inside. And the simple, simple solution of the Messenger wasallam, a smile of the wife when the husband comes home. You know how big a deal this is? This is not a small thing. It stabs the husband when the husband comes home and the wife doesn't care. And you know, he's very disturbed by that. He may not say something, but it really, really hurts husbands. And it hurts the relationship. And it comes out in weird ways. Now that they're hurt, they're kind of upset as they're having dinner. Oh, there's not enough salt in here. You know, there's something wrong. And they're extra angry at the kids. They're frustrated. But the same scenario, the, the wife opens the door and she greets the husband with a smile. Just a smile, it's not expensive. But what happens? The rest of the night goes smoothly. The husband's in a good mood, he's talking to her. When he's talking to her, I, I don't want to talk right now, I have a headache. It's not going to happen. All started from where? Just one little act of the wife. These are simple solutions, but they're powerful solutions. And you don't take care of these solutions, and things, this baggage just keeps adding up and adding up and adding up, and that's where you get those statistics. Because the husband doesn't even want to look at the wife. She's just annoying. You know, she just does this or that, right? So, both sides have to understand. They have to take care of the other side. Instead of expecting from the other side, just make a goal for yourself to take care of the other side. This is illa ala azwajihim. The only time they don't guard their privates is with their spouses. And this relationship is very strong. I don't even want to quote the hadith, even though you know quoting a hadith is a good thing. But I know the repercussions it can have in our community. Unfortunately, I don't personally, Allahu alam, I don't personally feel that Muslim families are mature enough to take a hadith and take it in a mature way. Usually, they end up using Islamic texts as a weapon. You know what the Prophet said about the wife? Who doesn't take care of her husband's need at night? He said this, this, this. You should be ashamed of yourself. You know, well, she's really going to be nice to you now. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not a contest. You know, she, you should be more like the Sahabiya, and she'd be like, you're no Sahabi yourself, you know. <laughs> That's how it's going to be. So if, if you want to make it a competition, you will never defeat women, not, not your mother, not your sister, not your wife. You will never defeat them in argument. Because what they can come up with, you didn't even think of from the back of your head. Right? <laughs> Allah put this in them. You know, they have, they have the power of, of speech, psychological speech, psychologically effective speech. So you have to learn to deal with that. The other thing, another piece of advice, just in terms of uh, harmony between husband and wife, is that, you know, argumentation. Men seem to think everything can be solved by reasoning and logical evidences, right? And they, they forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create women in this simple black and white fashion. Women are complicated creatures. When you get married, many of you will testify your wife is crying one day. And you ask her, why are you crying? She'll say, I don't know. 
I, I, I'll talk to you later about it. And you say, no really, is this something I did? No, leave me alone. I don't know. And they really don't know sometimes. And if they do, it's too complicated for you to understand. So they'll say, you're not going to get it. <laughs> right? So they're complex creatures. And so you will learn this. And when you're not married, you'll learn this with your mother and you will learn this with your sister. You try to reason with them, you give them reasons for why you did something that disappointed them. They'll say, oh, so you know so much better, fine. Next time, I shouldn't argue with you because you're so smart. Right? And their feelings will be hurt. Who just lost that argument? You did. Because you tried to reason. The way you argue, or you want to make your point with women, what's the best way to make your point with women? It's not by argument. The, west, the best way to make a point with your wife, to make a point with your mother, is actually the sunnah of the Messenger wasallam. One mercy, second silence. Silence. You know how effective silence is for good believing wives? If the husband is silent, then she will say, what's the matter? Is there something I did? But if the husband talks back, man, she will talk back way better than you can. Right? She will come back with a better rebound than you ever thought it possible. But if you're silent, and if there's an ounce of good in her, goodness in her, she will come and say, maybe even if I don't think it was my fault, it was my fault, I'm sorry. But the husband has to learn this technique of silence. And not silence with a frown and pushing her away. Just a little extra sad puppy face here and there. You know, try it with your mom, see if it works. And it will work <laughs> with your wives also, inshaAllah ta'ala. Right? But this is important, these are the etiquette of marriage. The Messenger والسلام, he could yell at his spouses. He could say harsh things to them. He doesn't. Because you know the, the relationship is so fragile, this relationship. And shaitan wants every opportunity to destroy it. And as soon as he destroys it, what's gonna happen? Corruption in the Muslim community is gonna happen. That's what's gonna happen. Men are gonna be not guarding their eyes anymore. And other things are gonna happen. Scandals are gonna spread. This is how they spread. From bad marriages. All the great tragedies that happen in the Muslim community that people don't even want to talk about because they sound so disgusting, where do they start? They start from a husband not take care, taking care of the wife and a wife not taking care of the husband. So this is, this is at the heart of being a believer and sustaining our iman. Taking care of the wife and taking, taking, taking care of the husband. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the best husbands and grant us the best wives. Then the next thing, uh, what your right hands possess. And of course, this is a big bone to pick among Western academics. You know, how come Islam allowed for women slaves and all of this stuff. The first response that you need to understand is that, you know, if you just change the terminology just a tad bit, just a little bit, I'll take five more minutes and I'm done, inshallah. If you change terminology just a little bit, historically speaking, when were women taken as captives in situations of war? I'm not talking about the Islamic civilization alone. Historically speaking, any civilization, when are women taken as prisoner, either, either under prostitution or under war, right? They're taken as captives, POWs. Now, either of those scenarios, how pleasant are they for women? Those two situations in which women are under another's rule, another's you know, uh, authority. Both of those situations are horrendous, even today. If women are captured in a village by a military, you know what happens. In our times, by the most civilized army, right? By the most humanistic army. The army that takes two years of ethical training, and then goes and takes over a village, what happens to those women too, right? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, and it, you know, our deen isn't in idealism. Our deen is in practical realities. The practical reality is this situation will occur. There will be women that you know, will be in that situation. So what do you do with them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them under the authority of the believers. And the other interesting thing in this, is that you know, POWs, you can do whatever you want, unthinkable things with them, and nobody can question you. But this is not the case with malakat aymanukum. What your right hands possess, they have rights. Their children have a shared inheritance. Practically, they enjoy everything a wife enjoys. The only difference is the term nikah. And why not the term nikah? It's a very simple thing. You know the nikah is a transfer of responsibility? That's, it's a contract which transfers responsibility from who to who? It transfers responsibility from the previous wali to the new wali. The previous wali was who? The father, if there's a brother or a grandfather, somebody, the man of the house, right? And now who's the new wali? The husband. It's a transfer of responsibility. In situations where the woman was already inside your house, I mean, before Islam, even the Sahaba owned some women. They're already there. If you do nikah, nikah technically means transfer of responsibility. So who are they transferring responsibility from? Themselves? It doesn't make sense. So what do you have to have? The responsibility itself. 
The transfer is not so important as the responsibilities themselves. So what does Qur'an and Sunnah do? It reveals the responsibilities in those situations. In case there's a transfer, nikah. In case there's no transfer, the responsibilities apply. You follow? So this is the second thing. So it's semantics. And if you just look at this one word, responsibility, and you say, you know what, you have a problem with the word concubines? Let's talk about the word responsibility. Let's talk about Western society, where every two and a half to three minutes a rape is taking place, and teenage girls in public schools are getting pregnant, and they don't know who did it. And this hideous society is, is coming to life, and nobody's taking the one word. <laughs> nobody's taking responsibility. Nobody's taking responsibility. They don't even know where to go. And there's this chaotic situation in the society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals something that takes care of the chaotic situation in society. And the final comment about this, probably the most important one. Between ayahs number 32 and 33 of Surah An-Nur, which is the next surah. This is Al-Mu'minun, the next surah is Surah An-Nur. 32 and 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is homework for you. Read tafsir of 32 and 33 of Surah An-Nur. In those ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the door for women that were owned at the time, that they can work their way to getting married to somebody and earn their freedom. And once that happened, the only women that were left in the possession of right hands of the Muslims were either women that were, you know, um, in some way uh, handicapped, that couldn't get married for whatever sickness or something else, or they were too young to get married. There was the only two kinds of women left. Every other woman, they worked their way towards freedom. And this is a historical fact within the Sahaba's time. And that door to that, you know, that reform in society was opened by just two ayat of Qur'an, 32 and 33 of Surah An-Nur. Right? So this is a historical phenomenon that we have to understand. People are making criticism about our book, and they seem like heavy criticisms only for one reason. We don't know our book. That's the only reason it feels like, oh my God, how do you respond to that? When they tell us, kill them wherever you find them, the ayah they quote from Surah At-Tawbah or Surah Al-Baqarah and other places, right? قَاتِلُوهُمْ you know, وَقْتُلُوهُمْ Kill them and fight them and kill them and fight them. How do we respond to that? And since we haven't studied our book, we don't know how to respond. But the reality of the matter is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this book to people who have decent fitrah, right? Which means everything that is in Qur'an and everything that is in the sunnah of the Messenger wasallam appeals to decent human beings. It's just a matter of explaining it properly. Not compromising anything, it just has to be explained properly. Like the issue of concubines, put it in perspective to historically POW women and it sounds like the most humane solution. Go to a woman that's imprisoned, a woman that's been imprisoned in a camp in China or somewhere in, in Europe, right? Or in Russia or somewhere. And you give her the option, this is what Qur'an is offering you, and you can stay here if you want, because this is the Western solution. What would you take? You ask a professor somewhere sitting in a university, on the leather couch, discussing these things, he'll say, well, the Western solution is better. And ask a woman that's in that state, so she'll take the Islamic solution, please. Right? Because it's grounded in reality, not in theory. That's what it is. So we have to have confidence in our deen. You know, these things that are mentioned, they're not controversial, they're not things to be ashamed of, they're things that will actually poke a bigger criticism on society. Why aren't you looking at this solution? Do we have to tell you this? Or you're, you're telling us to do your way, that's obviously not working, right? So, إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ then they are not to be blamed. فَمَنِ ابْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْعَدُونَ Then whoever pursues a way other than that, even if Allah made the halal means open, somebody pursues another way, then they are the ones that have transgressed. They are the ones that have transgressed. Inshallah ta'ala, we're just going to discuss that, that part of it. The, the pursuit of ways other than marriage. And how the Muslim community has made the halal way of marriage so profoundly difficult for its youth, that the haram way is so much easier an option. You know? And it, we've done that to our kids. We've done it to our kids by making nikah extremely extreme Muslim community. So we'll discuss that tomorrow bi idnillah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Qur'an. Bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum.